y'all are going to be doing it. You just use them in one camera from there? Yeah. Uh, the program manager, Dick Sprahalski, uh and I go way back, and uh, you know he's one of the fortunate people that uh, I've known, and that uh, he's worked some very challenging programs, and, and they've all been very, very successful. He graduated from Cornell University and went to work for JPL, and I think just about all of his career, if not the majority of it, has been working uh, uh, planetary explorations. Uh, starting out with uh, Mariner uh, Venus in 62, and he worked uh, Voyager. Uh, he was a uh, manager for Galileo, and uh, today he's the program manager for Cassini, and I'd like to welcome Dick and his people here for the briefing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Floyd. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the, yeah, the Cassini spacecraft is here at the uh, gate starting well into its processing, getting, getting ready for launch. Uh, the probe is here from the European Space Agency uh, in Europe, and uh, they're in parallel uh, preparations with the rest of the spacecraft, and we will be electrically hooking up with them shortly and uh, verifying that uh, all those interfaces are correct. So we're on schedule for a, a launch to Saturn five months from today. And that is not a very long time. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, we were just over this morning and briefed the, uh, the people on the launch system, Titan 4B. You, you people are very fortunate. They had to stand up on a concrete floor and, and listen to us babble for an hour. And consequently, the crowd thinned out as, as time went on. I hope, hope you people stay with us. Anyhow, we are, uh, we are on, on the way to uh, launch in October. The schedule on the launch system is, is very tight. However, they are putting forth uh, ex excellent efforts to uh, maintain schedule, and they've actually uh, picked up nine days of additional margin uh, on the launch system, so uh, we're very pleased about that. What we're going to do this morning is give you uh, uh, an overview of, of the program, principally the flight system. I'll make a few introductory uh, comments and then turn it over to Alice Miner from our Science and Mission Design Office who will talk about the mission and the science. And then Chris Jones will cover the remainder of the flight system. Chris is the uh, spacecraft development manager here uh, for, uh, for Cassini. And then we'll come back and, and entertain questions after that. So uh, with that, I'd, I'd like to move on to the first chart. Is there a button? Okay, this is a uh, uh, montage of the uh, Saturnian system where we're going. You can see Saturn in the middle with, the, with its rings and some of the satellites of Saturn uh, displayed about it. Uh, most of them are what we call icy satellites, meaning they have no, uh, no, no atmosphere. It's condensed out and frozen on the surface. Up in the le far left-hand corner is the one of, uh, of very strong interest. It's called Titan. It's the only satellite in our uh, known satellite in our solar system that has an atmosphere. The atmosphere has about the same percentage of uh, nitrogen as we have here on Earth, but the other constituents are, uh, are uh, probably uh, complex or organic molecules and so forth. And Huygens probe, which we deliver, which is the ESA part of the program, which we deliver to uh, Titan, will be the descent into Titan's atmosphere and take data as it goes down through the, to the surface. And Alice will give you a better idea of, of what some of that data is. So this is the uh, where we're going. The uh, participants in Cassini are uh, wide and varied. Cassini is a large international uh, program. Uh, there's 17 total flags up there. One is the United States. The rest are all European. 
and it represents the uh, uh, European Space Agency, which has most of those members. The Italian Space Agency is a separate player in itself and contributing engineering uh, hardware, important telecom hardware to the spacecraft, as well as elements of some of the uh, science instruments. So uh, we have put those two large space agencies and each one of our science instruments represents a cooperative international venture of its own. You'll see when Alice talks about instruments that there are uh, the flags of the nations that are involved in each of our scientific investigations. We have uh, over 240 uh, scientists internationally that are in some way working on and contributing to uh, through the Cassini program. And finally, the total team is, is shown here. Uh, four NASA centers are involved, including the Kennedy Space Center here, where Floyd's organization is responsible for uh, the NASA part of management on the Titan IV Centaur system and its flow, and the integration of the, uh, of the Cassini spacecraft and, and probe activity here. The Department of Energy provides the power sources. Since Saturn is so far away from the sun, uh, the illumination there, the solar intensity is less like 1% of what it is here on Earth. Solar panels won't do the job, and so the nuclear technology of RTGs, radioisotope thermal electric generators, is used, as well as heater units to uh, keep spacecraft elements warm. Uh, the Depart Department of Defense provides the launch system, the Titan IV-B with the SR solid rocket motor upgrades and the Centaur. That's all done on a reimbursable basis from NASA. And the European Space Agency provides the uh, Huygens probe and operates it. And I'd like to introduce Hamid Hassan here in the front row who is the Cassini or the Huygens probe project manager and my counterpart from the ESTEC organization. And then the Italian Space Agency, as I mentioned, provides the antennas and uh, part of the science investigation. And finally, there's 27 science investigation teams spread over uh, 14 countries and 20 separate institutions. So it's a very large, widespread program. It's all coming together now here in Florida, KSC and Cape Canaveral Air Station. We're on schedule for a uh, launch in October. On October 6th, we want to launch on the first second of the first minute of the first hour of that available launch launch window, and, and that's that's what we're working to. Charlie Colhase was uh, put this uh, pre coordinated this presentation for us. He's our uh, science and mission design manager. He was unable to be here. His mother passed away on Sunday evening, so he had, had to uh, go, go to his hometown. Uh, he has handed off his uh, presentation material to Alice Miner, who will cover both the uh, mission and, and the science part of the program. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Alice. Thank you, Steve. Get the electronics all attached up so I can free myself from the pulpit. And uh, we'll get underway. That's not good. What happens? I'm uh, Alice Miner. I'm the science manager on the project. I work, as uh, Steve said, with Charlie Colbase. Uh, who is probably right at this moment preparing to attend his mother's funeral in Tennessee. Rather unexpected. Let's go ahead with the slides. When we talk about the science we're going to be doing with the Cassini and the spacecraft, uh, we divide that into about the five different areas of investigation. The planet itself, We'll be studying the atmosphere and the interior of the planet. We also are going to
going to make a special effort to do a better job of understanding the rings of this magnificent planet, which of course are the, the things that uh, are probably part of the most complex structure of the small particles that we meet anywhere in our existence, in our experience with uh, uh, doing missions of this nature. Titan, of course, is the primary satellite of Saturn and the target of the Huygens probe, as well as the target of uh, most of our orbiter investigations. Uh, we will be doing studies of this moon, which has an atmospheric pressure at its surface, which is 60% greater than that of Earth's atmosphere. In addition to this large satellite, we have 17 other smaller known satellites, which we are designating here as the icy satellites of Saturn. They are composed for the most part of water ice, though their surfaces may have materials other than water ice, and indeed their markings on them indicate that there is a lot of meteoritic debris on the surfaces of those moons. They have a variety of sizes and shapes. The small ones are irregular. One of them at least is a captured asteroid, and probably not icy in the normal sense of the word. And then this huge structure, which surrounds the planet itself, which houses charged particles, dust particles, uh, neutral particles, and of course the huge magnetic field that uh, uh, is swept away from the planet by the incoming pressure of solar wind particles. The planet itself is the second largest in the solar system. It's a giant ball of gas, uh, mostly hydrogen and helium in the outer portions that we can see. The cloud layers that, we, that form the colors that you can see are ammonia ice crystals. The rings that circle the planet are ice, for the most part water ice. The interior of the planet probably contains a large proportion of water in its gaseous or compressed liquid form. <coughs> Maybe down near the center there is a core of heavier materials. Those heavier materials, excuse me while I turn off my beeper. <laughs> right now I should be getting out of a class I teach back in Pasadena. In addition to the rings here, you can see three satellites of Saturn and the shadow of a fourth. These are four then of the 17 icy satellites in addition to the large moon Titan. We see occasional storminess in the atmosphere of the planet. This, of course, is a very much color enhanced picture from Voyager, so that the storm activity here in the northern hemisphere can be seen a little more clearly. That storm activity is not quite as prevalent in the atmosphere of Saturn as it is in the atmosphere of Jupiter. That may be because there is uh, a higher uh, velocity uh, wind stream in the atmosphere of Saturn than there is in that of Jupiter, and apparently less opportunity for there to be interaction across latitude bands. The banding, of course, is uh, constant in latitude. We have seen recently, however, some evidence from the Hubble Space Telescope that a huge storm is still brewing in the equatorial region of Saturn, which would be down here in the lower right-hand corner. The rings of Saturn, shown here in a picture from Voyager 2, have a, an enormous amount of radial detail in them. This is the Cassini division. Outward of that is the A ring. This large portion here in the middle is the B ring. And interior to that, a C ring and a D ring. Exterior to the A ring, we have two narrow rings, the F and G ring, and the very tenuous P e ring that extends out through the satellite. Inside of the B ring here, you can see several of these radial spokes that are generated, we believe, by the impact of meteorites with the rings, uh, scattering large clouds of uh, tiny particles that are then electrically charged by the magnetic field or by sunlight and then frozen, uh, in a sense, in the magnetic field so that they rotate with the magnetic field rather than with the, the neutral ice particles in the rings beneath them. These spokes persist for a matter of uh, sometimes two or three or even four
four rotations around the planet before they dissipate and others that have been generated in the meantime take their place. Two of the icy satellites that are of particular interest to us, Iapetus on the right was discovered by William Mosell. You can see it only, however, on the right side of the planet. He could never find it on the left side. We later came to discover that the reason for that is that the side that faces Earth when the, this moon is on the left side of Saturn is only one-sixth as bright as the side that faces us when it's on the right side. So it's too dark for him to see in his telescope at that time. This enormous difference in brightness between the two faces of Iapetus uh, is still to be understood. We took pictures of it uh, from Voyager, but we don't know whether the dark material is material that has been swept up from orbit, dust particles, dark dust particles around Saturn, or whether it's that the front face has been scoured by uh, different sorts of particles and revealed a darker material that underlies the surface material on the other side. That's one of the questions we hope to be able to answer. Enceladus, on the other hand, appears to be a very, very young moon, geologically speaking. It may still have activity on its surface. Uh, one intriguing fact is that the E-ring seems to have its maximum density right at the orbit of Enceladus. And there is some possibility that Enceladus will have active water volcanoes on its surface, viewing ice particles into space that feed the E-ring. We want to check and see if we can see any direct evidence of such ice uh, volcanoes. The magnetic field I've already described in part, in addition to the magnetic fields that are represented by these uh, blue structures here, there is a neutral torus of particles surrounding Titan and probably have as their source the atmosphere of Titan. Titan itself does not appear to have a magnetic field we will, however, study it to see whether there might be an induced magnetic field caused by the flow of the magnetic uh, uh, fields past Titan. It has a tail in the downward and I sunward direction caused by the pressure of the solar wind particles streaming out from the sun. And the size of this whole thing is enormous, much larger than the sun itself. The only thing in the solar system that's larger than this is uh, the magnetic field of Jupiter, about 50% larger. How do we deliver the probe to Titan? Uh, contrary to the procedure that was used for the delivery of the probe to Jupiter, we actually carry the, the Huygens probe into orbit, inserting into orbit on the 1st of July, in the year 2004, swinging into a long orbit that allows us to reach our farthest point from the planet on the 13th of September 2004, where we do a periapsis raise maneuver so that we don't go down nearly as close to Saturn again, and at the same time target the whole spacecraft for an impact with the moon Titan. We do that so that we can deliver the probe to Titan. We actually release the probe on the 6th of November 2004, and two days later, we do an orbiter deflection maneuver so the, the orbiter spacecraft doesn't follow the probe into the atmosphere of Titan. We also delay it somewhat so that it is lagging behind the probe. As the probe enters the atmosphere of Titan, it is then in a position to collect the relay data from the probe, record it on board for later transmission back to Earth. Here we see uh, an artist's uh, rendition of uh, the probe just after it's been released from this holding ring on the side of the spacecraft, descending down toward uh, the atmosphere of Titan. Uh, about 20 days before it actually reaches Titan is when this release occurs, Saturn off in the distance behind Titan. An interesting picture that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope uh, uh, about a year and a half ago indicates that the surface of Titan is not uniform in its brightness in the infrared. In fact, there is one particularly bright area here, and this is uh, on uh, the face that faces away from Saturn is, is right centered right on here. This is sort of to the right-hand limb of Saturn, uh, right-hand limb of Titan as we we're approaching it with Titan between us and Saturn. And the place where the Huygens probe is projected to land right now is marked by this green ellipse. 
very narrow in its north-south direction, but extended in the east-west direction because of our lack of knowledge of the, of the winds on Titan. I just attended a Titan symposium this last, uh, the week before last, in which it was fairly well determined that the winds are appropriate, that is, they blow in the same direction that Titan rotates. So we can probably remove most of the left-hand portion of this ellipse here. And that puts the landing ellipse now very close to the edge of whatever this is. Uh, perhaps a, a, a continent or a high area on the surface. Another thing that was revealed at that Titan conference is that this modeled area over here cannot possibly be entirely liquid. At one time we thought that there might be a global ocean of methane and ethane liquid on the surface of Titan. We now believe that that can't possibly be the case. There must be mostly solid ice or at least a non-liquid surface over the majority of the surface of Titan. On the other hand, there has to be some sort of liquid there to feed the atmosphere that contains both nitrogen and methane. Uh, the methane would uh, be depleted from that atmosphere fairly rapidly if it were not replenished uh, from the surface of Titan. The probe will descend over a period of about two and a half hours from an altitude around 170 kilometers, uh, just over 100 miles above the surface, uh, being slowed down first by a small chute. The main chute is deployed, the decelerator is jettisoned, and then uh, from that point on down we take uh, data. Uh, toward the end we replace the large chute with a smaller one so that the the descent can be completed within the, the two and a half hours so that we have lifetime for the batteries. Actually, those batteries are, are designed to last at least three hours, and so we hope to get also about a half an hour's worth of data transmission after the probe reaches the surface of Titan. And one of the six instrument packages on board the probe is designed to measure the surface itself, surface height package. The orbiter after Relaying the probe data to Earth will also do studies of Titan and the other targets that I mentioned early in the talk. One of them that's designed specifically for Titan is a radar on board the orbiter spacecraft that will be able to map the surface through the thick haze that covers uh, the surface of Titan. <coughs> it also has some applications in other areas. It, it will serve as an altimeter to determine the, the surface altitude variation radiometer so that you can uh, map the entire surface even if you don't bounce radar off of it and possibly as a scatterometer for studies of the rings um, and additionally uh, the IP satellites and perhaps using the radiometer for type as well. The uh, nations that are participating are shown here. The United States, of course, has the largest number of investigators, but France and Germany have large numbers of investigators as well. And we've already mentioned uh, substantial contributions from Italy and from the other nations that are shown here. Let me go through the instruments very quickly before I go on to describe the mission. The composite infrared spectrometer is designed primarily to measure the atmospheric gaseous content of Saturn and Titan. It can also measure the temperatures of those atmospheres and the temperatures of the surfaces of the satellites. <coughs> the imaging system uh, has both a wide angle and a narrow angle camera. Uh, the narrow angle camera uh, is perhaps the highest resolution, is the highest resolution instrument on board the spacecraft and uh, will be able to see on the surfaces of the moons that it flies close to uh, areas as small as a few meters across. Charles Alachi has the radar team, which I've already talked about. Larry Esposito uh, leads an ultraviolet uh, uh, imaging spectrograph uh, uh, instrument, uh, which uh, will do some measuring of the higher atmospheres of the planet, search for atmospheres, <coughs> excuse me, of Titan and Saturn. Uh, search for atmospheres around the icy satellites and also try to measure the ratio of hydrogen to deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, uh, in those atmospheres. That will tell us a little bit about the origins uh, and lifetimes of those atmospheres. Uh, the visual and infrared mapping spectrometer uh, measures the composition of the surfaces of the icy satellites. They also do 
some mapping of the surface of Titan uh, if it can see clearly enough through the haze that overlies that surface. We have a number of fields and particles instruments. The Cassini plasma spectrometer uh, measures the highly charged particles that are trapped within the magnetic field of Saturn. The cosmic dust analyzer uh, is looking for the particles that are smaller than those that you see in the rings of Saturn that happen to be flying around the system or are in the interplanetary system if we have a chance to measure some of those uh, during the years before we reach Saturn. The ion and neutral mass spectrometer, oh, excuse me, I, I missed the magnetometer. We have two types of magnetometers, uh, mainly designed to measure the magnetic field of Saturn and uh, its higher order components. We also will be able to see whether Titan or any of the other satellites have uh, intrinsic magnetic fields of their own. The ion and neutral mass spectrometer is designed primarily to, to measure the atmosphere of Titan that we fly through, that upper atmosphere up above about 950 kilometers altitude. The magnetospheric imaging instrument is of a nature that we have never flown on this planetary mission before. It actually has a, a, a portion of its uh, instrumentation which is designed to make maps, uh, sort of a, like a, a camera of the structure of the magnetic field of the charged particles contained within that from a distance rather than having to do it uh, right as we fly through it. So that will give us a much better global view of what the magnetic field looks like. The uh, radio plasma wave science instrument is comparable to the plasma wave science instruments that have flown on Voyager and Galileo. It recorded the sounds of Saturn uh, with Voyager. It also uh, records uh, radio waves uh, that are slightly higher frequency than the sound frequencies that we hear here on Earth. Uh, the, uh, Radio science instrument is actually a more remote sensing instrument. It alone of all the instruments on the spacecraft does not have a detector on the spacecraft. Rather, it uses the spacecraft as a beacon of three different uh, radio frequencies and receives those signals on the ground and interprets the changes in the signals whose characteristics are known very well when they leave the spacecraft. Uh, in terms of the science of uh, atmospheres or rings between the spacecraft and the Earth. Uh, we have uh, six investigations, as I indicated, on the probe. The aerosol collector and pyrolyzer collects small particles that are suspended in the atmosphere of Titan, melts and vaporizes them so they can be sent into the gas chromatograph and mass spectrometer for analysis as to their composition. Uh, this instrument also measures those uh, components that are already gaseous. The descent imager is a camera on the orbiter, has 11 fields of view, and as the orbit, as, excuse me, on the uh, uh, probe, and as the probe <coughs> spins during its descent, it takes a series of pictures that it can uh, use to construct a complete, more or less complete view, not only of the surface, but of the clouds beneath it, clouds above it and uh, a side-looking uh, radiometer to find out how much uh, sunlight is actually getting through those clouds. The Doppler wind experiment uses uh, the signals from the spacecraft and the change in the frequency of those signals to determine the winds that are blowing across the surface and uh, the rotation of the probe and a number of other things of that nature. The atmospheric structure instrument measures temperatures and pressures of the atmosphere as uh, the probe descends and the surface science package, as I indicated earlier, is designed for measurements of the surface. It will determine if we land in the liquid, what the density of that liquid is. If we land on the surface, how far the surface is. It has an accelerometer in there and a number of other instruments of that nature, uh, as well as pressure measurements and uh, temperature measurements of the surface. on visual observations or on telescopes. The first individual to see Saturn through a telescope as nearly as we were able to determine was Galileo Galilei in uh, the year 1611. When he saw it, he saw what he thought was a little satellite on the right and on the left of Saturn, uh, but they didn't move. And that rather confused him because he was used to seeing moons that circle around like in Jupiter. Uh, when he 
and looked at it the next year, he found that even those two moons had disappeared. And uh, he never did really determine, uh, never did really understand what it was he had seen. And only later, the other observers <coughs> determined that what Galileo had seen was actually uh, a continuous ring of material orbiting the planet. Uh, the first year when he looked, they were barely open, and so all he saw was a little bit of the edge of the ring sticking out from the planet. The second year he looked, the rings were actually edged onto the Earth and invisible in his telescope. I'm just going to show the location of some of the science instruments. Chris will be describing this in a little bit more detail later on. Magnetometers are located midway and at the end of an 11 meter boom. Uh, we have uh, four of our remote sensing instruments on board this uh, remote sensing pallet here, including the visible and infrared mapping spectrometer, the two cameras of the imaging system, the composite infrared spectrometer. On the back side is the ultraviolet uh, imaging spectrograph. Three of our instrument packages in the fields and particles uh, domain are contained on this fields and particles pallet. There is uh, uh, three antennas that are part of the radio and plasma wave uh, system that uh, you can see sticking out on various parts of the spacecraft here. In this area, there is a, a garbage can-like looking thing, almost the size of a garbage can, that uh, collects the dust particles. The magnetospheric imaging instrument is located over in this area. And two of the investigations, the radar and radio science, use the high gain antenna, uh, either for transmitting or receiving or both of their data. The probe, of course, is attached on the side over here and contains these six other instruments. In order to get the data back from the spacecraft, we have to have receiving stations here on the Earth. They are located at the three longitudes around the Earth near uh, Canberra. Uh, Australia, Goldstone, California, and this complex near Madrid, Spain. Each of the complexes at present includes a 70 meter antenna and at least a couple of 34 meter antennas. We anticipate that most of our data collection will be by means of the 34 meter antennas. Occasionally on high activity days we will use the high gain antennas. The 34 meter antennas will also be used to transmit new commands to the spacecraft uh, that are stored on board the spacecraft and executed later. Uh, an artist's conception is depicted uh, in this poster. Most of you were able to get a copy of this poster, so you'll have that as a souvenir. This is sort of the designed after the old science fiction magazine, Science, uh, excuse me, Amazing Stories. <coughs> if you notice the date on this, uh, here, and then uh, we pass Earth for our third gravity assist, uh, passing Earth uh, in August of 99. We finally pass Jupiter on the next to the last day of the century, and we'll arrive at Saturn on the 1st of July, 2004. Here is an artist's conception of the, the two redundant main engines firing to slow the spacecraft down to put it into orbit around the planet. You'll notice that during the time of this burn, we are above the main rings of the planet. And uh, uh, this is the closest we'll ever get to the planet. After that, we raise the periapsis and never get in that close again. Jones. I'm the Spacecraft Development Manager uh, for the Senior Program at uh, JPL. And uh, what I want to do today is uh, give you sort of a walk around of the spacecraft. So we did a lot of this when the spacecraft was in Pasadena. People would come by, congressmen, teachers, uh, laboratory directors every now and then. And we'd uh, show them what the spacecraft is all about. That's what I mean. um, Spomalski mentioned that um, the um, Italian Space Agency had a uh, pivotal role in the development of the spacecraft. Uh, the high gain antenna uh, is their most visible contribution to the design. Uh, this, this antenna is four meters across, and uh, that's a very important figure for us uh, because, as Ellis mentioned, uh, our trajectory takes us in toward the planet Venus. 
fact, we fly by Venus a couple of times. And um, it gets quite hot. Uh, the solar intensity of Venus is 2.7 times uh, the intensity of the sun and Earth. And we use the antenna to cast a uh, shadow uh, back across the spacecraft. And so most of the spacecraft, in fact, is in the shade for two years, of the, the first two years of the mission. Uh, the exceptions uh, to that are these uh, thruster clusters. There are four of them, you can see two of them in this picture. They provide um, the attitude control torques necessary to keep the spacecraft pointed uh, during the mission. The magnetometer boom, which is uh, 11 meters in length, and these 10 meter uh, antennas uh, for the RPWS instrument remain stowed during that period of time because they can't take uh, the heat uh, generated at, at uh, Venus uh, solar distances. The spacecraft is powered by uh, three uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generators uh, that are shown here. Uh, these shades are not to uh, prevent the sun from hitting them, but preventing the thermal radiation from these devices uh, warming up the science instruments in the spacecraft above them. Uh, these three generators, uh, between them, generate about 12,000 thermal watts of power. That's converted to 800 electrical watts at the beginning of the mission and that decays to something on the order of 650 watts uh, by the time the mission is over. The Huygens uh, Titan probe is shown here. It's on the other side of the spacecraft in, in this view. Uh, the probe is roughly uh, 2.7 meters in diameter, about 350 kilograms. Um, that's a small mass when you consider that the total mass of this system is uh, almost six tons about 5,600 uh, kilograms, uh, most of which is liquid at launch. We uh, have a fairly uh, good-sized propulsion system. There are two large tanks that are buried beneath this equipment. Um, the, the bipropellant uh, load on the spacecraft at launch is 3,000 kilograms. It is another uh, 100 and 132 uh, kilograms of hydrazine, the Boston, Gavin sitting over here prompting me with all the numbers. Uh, he's been here a couple of weeks, he probably did all the names. Um, there's about 3,120 uh, kilograms of propellant at launch, and so it's about 55% liquid uh, at that phase. There are two uh, engines here that are the bipropellant engines. They generate about 100 pounds of thrust, not very much, and so you have to burn them for a long time to slow you down at Saturn. Uh, we, we only use one at a time. If one should fail, uh, there's software on board that will uh, turn off one engine and turn on the other to allow us to get in order. Uh, let's see, I guess a couple other things I can point out. Uh, the remote observation instruments are located here on the remote sensing tower. And the fields and particles instruments that measure the in situ or the, the local uh, environment, particles environment, and over here on uh, this power. This, this spacecraft is, is sort of like point and shoot. Uh, its predecessors, Galileo and Voyager, had scan platforms, and uh, the remote sensing instruments would be mounted on those, on those platforms, and you could articulate uh, the platform in, in one of, or any of two directions, and uh, essentially point the instruments independent of, of the base body. Uh, but these instruments are mounted, uh, hard mounted to the, the, the spacecraft, and so to point uh, the camera, for example, at Saturn, the whole system has to move. And I'll, I'll describe that uh, for you in a bit. This is a, a, an artist rendition of the Huygens probe. Uh, it has a uh, radiant heat shield that protects it from the uh, atmospheric entry heating uh, that it experiences on its uh, descent uh, into the Titan atmosphere. Uh, there are six instruments, and I believe five or six engineering subsystems, I can't remember the count, uh, that uh, make up uh, the probe. Uh, as Ellis mentioned, its, uh, its mission life is about three hours, with a handful of minutes um, on the surface. Uh, it's battery operated. Uh, it's checked out during the cruise period. Uh, it takes about 6.7 years to get to Saturn. 
And about every six months uh, during that period of time, uh, we can turn on the cell <coughs> and, and check it out. I once had a boss present uh, the total of the probe uh, components and the order components. Uh, the engineering and, and sciences, engineering subsystems and sciences are about equal in number. Uh, there are 35 uh, subsystems. Uh, some of them are subsystems. Of those 35, 21 of them, most of the science instruments and, and some of the engineering subsystems, are on board this. This is a highly computerized spacecraft, uh, more so than any other planetary uh, spacecraft before. Uh, there are 100,000 electronic parts, and here are the number of cool and transistors. And um, when we started factoring in the, the ASICs that we have, the application specific integrated circuits, uh, we came up with a number of, on the order of 10 million, I think it was, cool and transistors. Next, I don't know, that is what we gave it. 10 to the 10th uh, or so equivalent transistors in the memories. And so counted on, on previous systems. Uh, there are four languages that are used to program. Let's see, could you rotate that uh, 90 degrees uh, counterclockwise? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is uh, the remote sensing palette. Uh, the uh, narrow angle camera that we've been talking about is, is this device here. It's got a protective cover on it. Uh, here's the wide angle camera. Wide angle camera is, um, these are CCD based uh, instruments, uses the uh, spare optics from the Voyager wide angle camera. Uh, we saved a lot of money. To your right, uh, looking out 90 degrees from the instrument more sides are the two uh, stellar reference units, one here and one here. <coughs> Last fall, uh, we uh, assembled this, the Cassini uh, system and subjected it to uh, a, a series of environmental tests. Uh, here the spacecraft is being ready or maybe just completed the, uh, the acoustic test at JPL. Uh, the acoustic chamber appears in the background. Uh, the spacecraft is hanging uh, from this crane. So it's a good view of the spacecraft uh, with all the components showing. This is too cool. This is the um, this is the solar uh, uh, solar back simulator at JPL. It's a 25 meter chamber. Uh, Cassini is inside. Uh, these two guys up here on the genie boom uh, are in the process of mapping the solar beam. Uh, when we run this test, we want to make sure that the solar beam is uniform across uh, the system. You can see they've got a couple of the lights on. It really lights up the uh, the high beam antenna. Uh, you can see the, the thermal blanketing of the probe here. This is a great shot of the probe <coughs> in the foreground. Uh, most of uh, the instruments, um, the propulsion module behind here, are, are blanketed uh, with a thermal blanket, uh, providing the thermal control necessary. It also provides a good uh, defense against micrometeorites. So there's a section here of, of the magnetometer boom here on the floor. That's just uh, one section. As I mentioned, uh, it's 11 meters in length. It's certainly not fit in the chamber, but this was a test article to prove out its own. Okay, uh, that's the extent of you know, my presentation today. Uh, Dick, you want to take it from here? Okay, that's the uh, extent of the prepared material for today's presentation. We'd we'll be uh, glad to entertain questions if you have any. We've got some people here that can speak with details if you'd like or whatever. So yes, sir. I'm just about the end side for the probe. Um, why did you not particularly choose to land on the continent? Uh, well, uh, 
I don't know whether Alice said it or not, but we really don't know what those different color patterns are. That one object, bright object, is identified about the size of the continent of Australia. We don't know what it is, but the other point is we selected this landing site before that picture was taken. Just, just fortuitous that we landed. We are aiming for a transition point between uh, a bright and a darker spot. Uh, there is a risk that if it gets a little bit of a Eventually it would, but I think our calculations showed that it would uh, survive for a while. And the surface science package on board has uh, detectors that can detect oscillation or ang angular load or movement or whatever. So it would be good scientific information, <coughs> to, uh, even, if, even if it was the last gas of the probe. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Yes, we Yes, I've always wondered uh, since the separation of the probe is uh, one day's days out. Uh, is, I've always wondered about the orbital mechanics involved in the trajectory or, or how you actually point the probe. Uh, the, the probe on the type. Well, the, uh, the navigators <coughs> in this business uh, never cease to amaze me in what, what they're able to do. And, what they, what they do is generally much better than what they commit or predict in, in the beginning, but uh, uh, the results tend to demonstrate it's there. Uh, Charlie Colhays ran a number for me and said the, uh, the area of which the uh, uncertain area of uncertainty of the probe landing or entry spot on the planet is about uh, between 50 and 100 square kilometers. At, at that kind of distance. So if you take the, uh, the point at which we release the probe 21 days beforehand and the speed of the probe, that uh, we are hitting an object roughly, if uh, Tiger Wood peed off in LA, he'd be able to hit the Empire State Building in New York. So it's, it's fairly... Uh, but I, I agree. <laughs> you're a great straight man. I hope your way to find and reduce that color. Yes, sir. What uh, planning have you done for uh, any environmental, radical environmentalist uh, that you have or on? You talk about the nuclear protesters? Uh, that's, a, that's a fact of life that we have to deal with. The anti uh, uh, nuclear material space in space is there, uh, and and they're real uh, and they're sincere, and we have to treat them uh, exactly that way. Uh, we try to keep an open dialogue uh, with them if, if they're willing to speak. We have a worldwide web page that has all the nuclear. Uh, facts related to the Cassini Huygens mission, uh, and it's available to them, and they've used it, and they've used it against the, the mission in some of their publications. Uh, but mainly, we try to uh, deal with uh, responses to uh, criticisms and uh, misinformation that they provide, and uh, uh, deal with, with it in an open manner like that. Now, that's for the vocal critics, uh, people that may try civil disobedience and other things like that. We leave up to the local security areas, both civil and, and government that exist here. And there may be some of that as well. Yes, sir? There's, there's thought that there's liquid, liquid ocean on the high although it's probably fully the surface. I don't think we know. The, uh, the radar may help us, or uh, some data we gather might, might help us. At one time, uh, in, in my tenure on this mission, we thought there would be lights uh, of uh, organics or nitrogen. I, I think now it's more considered a solid surface, but what's below it and how deep we really don't know. And hopefully we can get some hints of that from the probe as well as the orbiter radar. There's certainly evidence that there is liquid at the surface. Uh, 
but how big the lakes are, we just don't know at this point. Any more questions? Yeah. The question is, what are we going to do for seven years of flight before we get to Saturn? And uh, uh, unfortunately, with the uh, limitations on, on budgets uh, for flight operations, we are not doing much in the way of science uh, going by Venus, Earth, or, or Jupiter, or the interplanetary uh, meeting. We will do some calibrations. Both at Earth and at Jupiter on various instruments, and we'll probably gather some dust data. But anything we do in the cruise has to come at the expense of taking something out of the tour when you're in a, in a zero sum game. So, uh, unless we find economies, efficiencies, and so forth that uh, allow us to do more or less or within what we have available, uh, we're going to be mainly navigating and trying to get to uh, where we want to be in a uh, well-configured and safe state. George. Now, I have a good picture of the Venus and Earth during the swing by. Would you be able to try any of that at all? None planned at this time. And actually, during Earth swing by, we'll try to be as quiescent as, as we can be stable, particularly up to the point where there's no chance of uh, a failure it could lead to uh, Earth impact. Over there, man. Uh, I have a question. Are you all making presentations in the local environment on the communication environment such as that here? Because sometimes I know you're off to get the people that access it as well. But when you're going to warn with somebody, um, maybe you can be more accepting and you know, understand something to accept it sometimes. Or you're going to be ready we haven't had many Californians come here and make presentations, but Ron Gillette, who's your local uh, contingency planning officer, federal official in charge, is, is both, uh, he talked last night at the uh, town council meeting for Cape Canaveral, and he's also spoken at uh, Brevard County, and he led the presentation to Governor Childs about uh, six months ago. So local KSC folks are, are available to do that. And we're glad to do it anytime we can to make it available. When we're here for our launch, uh, I mean, get closer to the launch and there's more visitors and so forth coming in, we'll be uh, making presentations to uh, our own visitors as well, which is probably some of the public at, at local hotel buildings, things like that. The, uh, Local space society sometimes sponsor luncheons and evening talks of that nature. What do you do to the spacecraft? What does the spacecraft have to the end of the mission? Well, the space. We can't fly it out of there. We don't have that Any more? Well, the faster, better, cheaper uh, uh, chant, or whatever you want to call it, is something that happened <laughs> shortly after uh, uh, we had restructured the scene and came with the arrival of Dan Goldman after he had been on, on the actually uh, used terminology that was very critical of uh, the scene. However, when it gets to the bottom line, uh, I think it's recognized throughout the agency that uh, is probably going to be the last, of, will be the last of the uh, large uh, flagship type of missions for the foreseeable future. There's just nothing happening out there that you can see going to provide the launch capability that you need for the 
pipe and floor and 